the University of Melbourne. And I'm guessing, given that it, the weather's pretty shitty here, he's probably currently in Melbourne rather than Sussex. Uh, no, no, no disrespect to the gentleman from Rye. I'm just saying that uh, I imagine he organises his life that way around. And um, it, it's called the Experience Machine. And it has, it takes effectively not a completely new theory, because the originator of the theory was really in the 19th century and a guy called Hermann von Helmholtz. But the theory is... The theory is that most of what we perceive is actually an internally generated prediction with our eyes, noses, ears and other senses effectively used to correct for what we expected, not to generate the data um, fresh. Now, let me explain this. Those of you who are into digital photography or anybody with a television, for that matter, or anybody who uses a computer knows that there are things called JPEGs. If you like, you can take your digital camera if it's reasonably expensive and you can shoot in raw mode, which means that every pixel is described in um, painstaking detail. Now, raw mode is what you use as a digital photographer if you're planning to do a lot of editing, because you need to have a value for every pixel in order to do really, really effective kind of photoshopping. The reason almost none of us, unless you have, you're a professional or prosumer photographer, the reason none of us shoot in raw mode is that a raw image is literally sort of 50 times larger or 30 times larger in terms of the space it takes up on your phone or your camera uh, than a JPEG. And the reason the JPEG achieves this data compression is that it assigns to each pixel or each pixel in each frame, in the case of MPEGs in video, an expectation value, which is based on what the adjoining pixels are. Okay, And if you've had three brown pixels in a row, you expect the fourth pixel to be brown. So you just describe that kind of as you'd expect. Very little data needs to be used, and you only use the data to describe the pixels that are doing something that wasn't predicted or expected. OK, and that's what digital cameras have arrived at as a data architecture, OK, for efficient band use of bandwidth. And the theory of Helmholtz Helmholtz, von Helmholtz, which came before there was such a thing as JPEGs, obviously, because it was the 19th century in Germany, um, and then later espoused by people like, for example, William James and um, people, um, uh, actually a few other people, I think, uh, also bought into this idea, is that the brain has the same data architecture that we don't actually use the seven megabits or whatever it is that our optic nerve provides to form a picture. What we do is our brain generates an expectation and we use the limited bandwidth within the optic nerve effectively to correct where reality differs from expectation. And so most of what we taste, most of what we smell, most of what we see is generated internally from an expectation and then corrected for if conflicting information emerges. So in other words, we, we, we use our bandwidth, our perceptual bandwidth to go, here's what you weren't expecting, not here's everything, okay? Does that make sense? Because it makes sense in the design of JPEGs and the design of televisions. You know, sky wouldn't work without data compression of imagery. Um, you'd simply need, you know, vastly more bandwidth. And in the same way, our brains wouldn't work if we tried to use the optic nerve uh, effectively to every single or 30 times a second or whatever it is to basically give us a complete up to date, accurate depiction of reality. Most of what we're seeing is internally generated. And if you wanted to summarize the book in a sentence, you could say, well, the science is in and the marketers were right all along. By which I mean that what we expect of something has a fundamentally significant bearing on how we perceive it and how we experience it. <laughs> and so, you know, I think it explains things that have often baffled me. It explains the fact that 3D TV never takes off. It explains the fact, if you want my prediction, that Apple's immersive 3D virtual reality thing will never be popular for significant lengths of time because for various reasons, it's not how we... It's not how we think or experience the world. And actually, 3D TV, most of the 3D-ness that we perceive is actually done internally in the brain. It doesn't require um, binocular vision to, to actually do it, which is why, if you think about it, 3D TV, <clears throat> um, if you go and see the, you know, the, the, the Parthenon 
at sunset, or you see the Colosseum, or you're looking at a beautiful beach. If you close one eye, you don't suddenly go, oh, that's shit. Like, oh, it was really beautiful just a minute ago. And now I've closed one eye and now it looks completely crap. OK, you know that actually, yeah, we use 3D vision. It's obviously essential if you're a cricketer, I imagine. OK, um, you know, you know, it's probably valuable in the evolutionary environment if you're throwing things or trying to grab a berry at close range. In the scheme of things in entertainment, it just isn't that important. OK, and so it all but it also explains why stage magic works, because effectively what always amazes me about stage magic, I've got a friend. Paul Craven, who's not only a very good behavioural scientist, he's also a brilliant um, magician. He's a member of the Magic Circle. And he makes the point... Now, it's not that surprising that stage magic works in front of an audience of 200 people. What's amazing is that it still works on TV, OK, when you've got an audience of millions who can pause and rewind as often as they like and nobody can see what it's done. And the reason is that what the magician does is he creates an expectation, flip from, flip from hand from hand, OK, you create the expectation and then you disguise the deviation from the expectation because you keep the coin in one hand and pretend to move it to the other one. And when you go, ba -ba, your hand is miraculously empty. You've amazed, you've effectively confounded someone's reasonable expectation. And once you accept this fact that actually most perception is internally generated, uh, the case for marketing, I think, becomes about five times stronger because what you perceive is what you get. And it's fascinating because I've just come off a call from the founder, uh, at Lena, who founded Air Up. I don't know if anybody has an Air Up water bottle. Do they have anybody here? And effectively, it's a water bottle that you fill with water, either still or sparkling. And then if you pull up the little nodule, the little capsule of scent, it scents the water. OK. And effectively, the reason she developed this extraordinary product, so you can effectively use tap water in combination with a small scent pod and basically create taste. You can't create 100 percent of the taste of, say, lemonade or Fanta, but you can create about 70 percent of it. And the reason that works is she basically was studying neuroscience and went to a neuroscientist who said that actually it only works one way around. So our smell if the smell originates in our mouth and in the water and then permeates through to the nose, that creates the illusion of a taste. If you had a pod and stuck it to your nose and breathed in while you drank water, um, uh, olfaction that comes in through the nostrils does not get processed as if it's taste. OK, it gets separately processed and allocated to a department of perception called smell. But then there's this separate form of olfaction, which is mouth up to nose, where effectively we process it as part of the taste experience. Because the tongue only detects, what is it, five things, sweet, sour, whatever it is, something or other, an umami, I can never remember what they are, <laughs> bitter, sweet, something, something else, and umami, okay, or monosodium glutamate, if you're a fan of Chinese food. And that just struck me as a brilliant innovation, which has come about um, in part because people are starting to realise that we need to optimise the world for perception, not for objective reality. And if we spend our time, and if or if AI spends its available bandwidth effectively, optimising for what we can easily measure, which is what is, rather than for optimising around how we feel, okay, this will lead to an extraordinary misdirection of effort. And so that book is, I think, one of the essential, you know, it's a kind of, I would say that theory is kind of foundational in doing what we do. Because essentially it explains why I think, OK, I mean, uh, you, you may have read this in my book. I think I mentioned it in the book. If you want to save money on a new car, just get your existing car and have it valeted. OK, <laughs> now, not only will you have a cleaner car, it'll drive a hell of a lot better. It'll feel smoother. It'll accelerate better. It'll be quieter. It'll corner better. Every aspect of your car will become a bit better when you have your car valeted. And I had a friend who was an engineer who was driven insane by this because he thought, why is it that my car's quieter after I've had it valeted? Why does it feel like a limo rather than a kind of, you know, a little bit of a banger after? And he said he thought he had this bizarre engineering theory that the act of polishing the car tautened the panels on the bodywork, <laughs> which reduced vibration. 
it isn't that it's just your brain going new car therefore i'm going to generate nice new car feeling when i drive it and you know i, th I find those things just endlessly really fascinating i mean you know you know maybe you know but also it partly explains why we process surprising information differently from expected information which is why perhaps you know creative advertising always has that slightly gratuitous element of huh? okay about it because essentially you know there's one form of attention which is business as usual attention and there's another form of attention which kicks in and generates effectively you know effectively we attach much greater importance to what's surprising than what isn't. And that, that brings me to things like, you know, thought insights in customer experience, which is that everybody benchmarks around what a hotel should do. And by the way, you should generally try and minimize nasty surprises in customer experience. I think that's an important thing to do. But it also suggests that we can do, we can achieve extraordinary and, and actually very, very cost-effective um, emotional effects by doing remarkably small things that weren't expected. I mean, if anybody's here wanting a brief over Christmas, the great brief and challenge for behavioural science is if you're a hotel, how do you make the check out experience feel really great? In other words, how do you how do you exploit the peak end rule to go, oh, that's really good? You know, you know, now I, I did jokingly say the one thing I'd like from a five star hotel, which they never do, is a person to go to your room and check you haven't left a sock or a pair of shoes behind or anything like that. But that's probably too time consuming. Uh, so a friend of mine who stayed at the Manuel Cat Saison um, in Oxfordshire, they actually because everybody drives there because it's in the middle of nowhere. And a lot of people stay the night because obviously they've had a lot to drink. And when you leave, they give you a box of hand baked biscuits or cookies to the American audience and say, here's something for your journey home, okay? Now, obviously you can do that if you're the man who our cat says, and you can afford to do it because the, the buggers have spent the best part of 1,200 quid on a dinner and an overnight stay. Okay, well, probably not that much, but not far off. But is there a way, now, you know, I notice things like, I, I don't know if they still do this, but Selfridges, if you pay by credit card, they say, thank you very much, Mr. Sutherland, okay? Now that's meaningful, it's unbelievably meaningful because nobody else does it. OK, it's not difficult. The name is on the card, assuming you're not using a stolen credit card. Um, it's generally really flattering and pleasant. But for whatever weird reason, nobody else does it. So that, By the way, book, that uh, book just, seeing, we just seeing about, Gareth Laura. here, I owe Gareth an email. So thank you enormously. The Stilton in particular, but all of them. Absolutely fantastic. So, Gareth, I, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that I owe you a huge vote of thanks, which is hugely delayed because it ended up in the parcel room of Ogilvy for a few days. But if anything, that only served to improve the Silton. So uh, dub double thanks to Gareth there. Sorry about that. <laughs> a segue into a, a cheese story. So that was the Experience Machine by Andy Clark that mm. uh, we were talking about there. It actually reminded me, Rory, of one of your guests at Nudge Stock. And that was Guy Leshziner. Now, he's written a book on the senses. I think it's called The Man Who Tasted Words. But his films video that he showed during his talk on stage were quite amazing, weren't they? Of people who were asleep, but to all extents and purposes, as we watched the film, it was as if they were awake. Uh, and, and and you have exactly this phenomenon where I, mean, I suppose dreams are, are partly explained by this. By the way, in the book, Andy Clark takes it even further and says there are things we should look at in in uh, um, in people who are neuro non typical, in particular things like Asperger's. Okay, which is to do with the calibration of incoming data versus expectation. Now, I'll give you just a very interesting where I think the, the reason I'm telling you this is because the theory is really, really interesting. But the theory also has very, very wide applications. And there's a really interesting finding in the book where people with a very large number of people with autism. OK, uh, um, uh, extraordinarily large number cut the labels out of their clothing because they find things like that really irritating. OK, and he suggests there's something to be learned here from this. Um, which is that, you know, if you if you don't have autism, if you're neurotypical, you, when you put a new piece of clothing on, you probably sense that I, I can sense it now when I think about it, the label on the back of my shirt that's touching my neck. But after about three seconds of wearing the shirt, it goes into expectation value and you no longer sense it. 
You know, it's very, very interesting that people with autism are continually irritated by this thing, which is where you get this problem of overstimulation, for example. OK, and then then the argument is that something like schizophrenia may happen the other way around, where actually what your brain is generating overwhelms your perception of reality to an extent where you start to get voices in your head and so on. So it's really it, it's, it you know, um, I think this theory it also explains, by the way, the whole patterns of brain movement, where if perception worked the way we conventionally think, which is top down. Um, you'd expect to see a lot of neural activity in one direction and not much in the other, as it were. And yet, if you look at the actual brain activity, it's actually dominated by kind of bottom up, generated internally expectation, corrected by. And this has a bearing on robotics, for example. So movement is you imagine a further a future state that you find desirable, like holding a mug, and then you move towards the mug constantly error correcting as you go which is why children are effectively learning to move and the process is bayesian effectively okay i don't want to get too nerdy here okay but what's fascinating there is that um uh, it looks like the big advances i met sir patrick valance at a dinner it was by the way i had to do an after dinner speech at the uh, annual harveyan dinner of the royal college of physicians and I must admit, still about four days beforehand, I was mentally just thinking, OK, after dinner speech to a load of doctors, you know, I better tee up a few off the cuff knob gags and make sure it's a bit of a laugh. And then about four days beforehand, I checked the invitation list, which included Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Valance. And I thought, I think I probably need to raise my game here a bit. <laughs> but um the, the the really real I, I mean I think it's I think this is fun to, to what Patrick Valance was saying is that the big progress in robotic movement because robots find really difficult to do the things that humans find really easy to do opening a doorknob for a robot is like a fumbling messy hopeless experience okay and similarly picking up that mug or holding an egg is something it's really really difficult to do. And the progress that's been made in robotics is effectively to make the process kind of work backwards effectively very 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 interesting i mean i would say by the way one of the reasons the book's so god i'm interesting is i've always thought that actually the creative solution in so many cases or the most one of the most useful creative kind of techniques is think about this backwards you know the most creativity most real breakthroughs happen backwards okay and actually Maybe, maybe this kind of process of expectation followed by correction is actually much more fundamental to the world than the process we prefer to think about, which is forward intention. And so I'm going to mention, you mentioned other books. I'm going to mention another business, actually, which has fascinated me. And I had this conversation, I don't know very much about medtech, but the, the guy who was one of the co-founders of this at Cambridge Biosciences Company. I was just chatting about this and he said, much to my surprise, because I thought what I was saying was fairly obvious, he said, thank you, you've just helped me clarify something that's been confusing me for 12 years, okay? And this company effectively, one of the co-founders was the co-discoverer of Viagra, which is famous for being a discovery that happened backwards. Okay, now if you look at the history of science, Nobody was trying to invent steam engines, just as nobody was trying to invent Red Bull. OK, no one was going, we really need a disgusting tasting drink. <laughs> right. OK, no one was trying to invent. Apparently, the Walls Vionetta came about because there was a wonky conveyor belt which juddered, which caused normal slabs of ice cream to be produced in a kind of <laughs> scroll work. OK, so, so, so from Viagra to penicillin to the Walls Vionetta to graphene to whatever. Most of this stuff actually happens backwards. It's also, if you like, weirdly, the intellectual justification for a kind of conservatism. I'm not making a political point here, <laughs> which is someone once described socialism as the mistaken belief you can get something right first time. In other words, you solve it in theory, implement it in practice. And actually the extent to which, and I, I won't talk about the bees again, because everybody will have heard me say that, but the extent to which there's this explore exploit trade off and that most real progress comes from exposing yourself to surprises, not in actually seeking out something that you've envisaged in advance. Okay. 
I, I, I think that's a fundamental kind of question in, in epistemology. But interestingly, it's kind of a fundamental uh, fundamental issue in creativity as well. And, you know, talking to John Cleese, that's another book I recommend. Probably I read it the year before, in fact, uh, although I've read it since because it's one of those books I reread, along with Obvious Adams, by the way. Robert Up de Graff's book, Obvious Adams, which looks like the hokiest, like, 1916 American kind of get-rich-quick business book when you first open it. But when you actually read it, it's it's very... It was one of David Ogilvy's favourite books, by the way, just, just to give it a bit more... Um, uh, 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 imprimatur, if you like, but but this 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 really interesting question in creativity that one of the reasons creative people are really annoying is they have a different methodology to most people. Now, occasionally, okay, I give a talk like this, typically to junior marketers. Okay, uh, it tends to be more junior marketers, and I give such a talk, and then. I'm told afterwards by five of them, not all of them, but a few people right back, you know, this was no use to me. I want to be told what to do. OK, yeah. I don't want to be told how to think. I want you to tell me if if you have to do this, then do these five things in this order. OK, and they get really, really frustrated with information which actually requires interpretation. They just want instruction. They just want an algorithm. OK. And I always say, look, if that, if your audience is like that, go and get somebody else. There are loads of people who know more about that than me. And, you know, frankly, that's not my forte because my forte is sitting around going, I don't know what to do next. OK. <laughs> and John Cleese's book, um, which is called Creativity, A Short and Cheerful Guide, makes the point that real imagination happens from people who effectively procrastinate. OK. And the reason they procrastinate is not is, is not because they're lazy, although they might also be lazy, OK? The reason they procrastinate is because they're waiting for inspiration to strike. They're waiting to get lucky. And Cleese describes this experiment which was done with architects. And they got a, a cross-section of architects to nominate the most creative architects, people who are generally regarded to be brilliantly inventive, OK? And then... Rather more furtively, they got those same architects to nominate 10 really workaday, uninteresting, boring, kind of lackluster architects. And they went and looked at how they worked. And the absolutely unvarying um, pattern that emerged was that the workaday architects started work straight away. They got the drawing board out and the bloody ruler and the routering. They got that out straight away as soon as they got back. They started planning for the thing. And the interesting creative architects didn't do, they, they doodled or they wandered around or whatever, right? And their, their time appeared to be totally wasted in the beginning of the process, okay? And um, what they were doing effectively was waiting to get lucky, waiting for some surprising information to either arise externally or to emerge in their own brain, which would give them effectively a head start. Okay, so in the case of a classic architectural case, Frank Lloyd Wright was briefed to build a house uh, falling water, as it subsequently became, uh, near River Run, Pennsylvania. If ever you find yourself in Western Pennsylvania, go there because it's fantastic. Okay, it's one of the best. You've got to book in advance a tour, but it's very well organised, and you'll probably get in if you book the day before. But it's great. Okay, and. Um, the original brief was, this is our favourite place. The family likes to swim in the waterfall. So can you build us a house overlooking the waterfall? And Wright, you know, dicks around for eight days or months or whatever it is. I don't know his working patterns. And then he suddenly has the inspiration. Why don't you just give them the rocks? Why don't you build the house on top of the waterfall? OK. In other words, let's rethink this. And it always interests me how you have, we have these mental blind spots and we have to wait for them to go away. And so this business of procrastination of starting late and waiting to get lucky or waiting for a blind... A lot of getting lucky is actually not actually seeing something new. It's sometimes waiting for a blind spot to disappear. It's waiting for an assumption to disappear. And that takes time. And I think it suddenly it occurred to me that, of course, creative people are kind of weird because they are really, really annoying if you want something done straight away to your exact specifications. They're the, they're the worst people in the world if that's what you want. But on the other hand, if you want a, a breakthrough innovation, or at least the chance of a breakthrough innovation, which solves the problem not incrementally, but by an order of magnitude, that's exactly what you need to do. 
And so, I, you know, I'm intrigued about how we eventually end up with what is creative AI and how is it different from the standard AI we're starting to see at the moment. Uh, you know, um, you know one, one like of the... Don Draper on his couch. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, no, I mean, that. what was interesting about that was, I mean, particularly, of course, the final sequence of the film where he's in an ashram in California and has the inspiration for the coke ad which is I keep realising that the real excitement comes when you, in, in many cases, it's actually when you stop seeing, you, you either start seeing or you stop assuming. And that's why a large part of creativity is actually reductive. You know, I always tell the story, by the way, um, it's another train story, but not the usual train story. The guy who designed the high-speed train, now, any, anybody in Britain here, the Intercity 125 high-speed train was almost produced as a kind of stopgap solution, two banging great diesel engines at either end of a train going really fast. And it turned out to be, in a, in a way, one of the most successful things ever done in rail in Britain. It was a fantastic train for the diesel age. It was, they were basically pretty reliable. They were bloody fast. They did tend to make, there was the stink of the uh, of the brake um pads that kind of got into the air conditioning i think they solved that eventually but basically it was a brilliant train very simply put together but when the guy who had the specification it included buffers behind the reason it looked unlike any other carriage uh, train is it was one of the earliest trains not to have separate carriages the train looked like one long tube and the original brief the original specification required buffers for shunting and the guy who designed the train said, uh, we actually said, why does the specification include buffers? And they said, it's for shunting. Are we ever going to shunt this train, given there's a diesel at both ends? Um, no. Right. Well, we don't need buffers then. And it's those kind of things, which is, the you know, a specification had got kind of rooted into procurement. And what the guy realised was that circumstances had changed. And so that assumed requirement for a railway carriage no longer applied. I think there's an awful lot that happens with technology, which is what no longer needs to happen. Now we have this technology. OK, I mean, I'm fascinated by the psychology of Zoom calls, which is why do we still make meetings an hour long? OK, you know, and funny enough, we said we suggested this to Zoom and they didn't take it up, which is you need to create a little format and a name for a 10 minute Zoom call. OK, you know, particularly if it's one to one, you know, maybe an hour is just too tiring. Maybe people can't commit, but you need you need to create a little thing called a Zoomette. That wasn't our recommended name, but you need to create a little thing, which is, by the way, just fancy 10 minutes on Zoom. Yeah. OK. The elevator pitch equivalent of Zoom. And we said, well, the main reason meetings are an hour long is if you travel to a meeting or you have to be in a place for a meeting, it's discourteous to make someone travel to something. Uh, and then give them 10 minutes of your time and make them go away. You know, you feel as if you've been kind of slightly um, hard done by. It was an absolute pain in the ass when we were based in Canary Wharf. Because quite often people will come and see me in Canary Wharf and they go, da 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 this is my work. And I, I might think, this is a really good book. I need to put you in touch with the creative director who's currently hiring. Okay. Now, I could do that in 10 minutes, but because they travelled out to Canary Wharf, you have to give them an hour of your time because otherwise you looked a bit of an asshole. OK, and then I suddenly realised, you know, I suddenly realised there are a load of assumptions here. Now, I've had a load of a few NHS and one, one private medical procedure. OK, and this came from a kind of thinking about Zoom, which is with a few people we had, we met up fairly regularly. And I said, look, this is really easy. Why don't we just block half an hour on Zoom on Monday and half an hour on Thursday? And if the Monday meeting doesn't happen, we'll do it on the Thursday. OK. So we've got a bit of wiggle room because nobody minds having one meeting cancelled. It's half an hour back in your day. Right? Cancelling a physical meeting is an absolute insult because someone might have planned their entire day around travelling to see you. Travelling a Zoom, cancelling a Zoom calls, you know, not really, it, it, it doesn't inconvenience the other party at all. Right. And then I suddenly thought, well, there must be a better way for the NHS to do waiting lists. My impression of the NHS, by the way, is that it's actually an extremely good service in terms of the medical care you receive with a very bad user interface. <laughs> OK. And by the way, the Ogilvy chap called uh, Deshwan uh, Domont, who's the Ogilvy's head of kind of UX, he's actually from the United States. OK. I said to him, what's your impression of the NHS as an American? And of course, as a UX expert. And he said exactly the same thing unprompted. He said it's a great, great service with a terrible user interface. And one of the things I said doing the NHS thing is, 
why don't they give me three appointments? OK, right. And say it'll probably be the middle one. But if we need to bring you if we can bring you forward because we have a vacancy or a cancellation, why don't you block out three days? out? Now, I'm having an operation. So it's, it's a day procedure. OK, but it's a day operation. I can easily not go on holiday and not and agree with my employer that I don't take any strong commitments on three forthcoming. OK, in order. And yet we also have the psychological benefit. OK, and you wouldn't feel you wouldn't feel, oh, God, now I'm back to the back of the queue again. Oh, God, they had to cancel my procedure. Now I'm back on the waiting list. You just go, oh, OK, I'll default to um, appointment number two. Now, all I'm saying, I'm not saying, by the way, I'm right, and this will require a whole load of economists who specialise in kind of coordination problems to see how you could improve things this way. What I just spotted was there's this underlying association, uh, sorry, there's this underlying assumption that when you make an appointment, you just make one. And actually, you know, a great thing would be, look, we'll block it, because free time isn't wasted. If you, you know, if you, I'm sitting here, if, if you all cancelled this, I would have been a bit offended if everybody simultaneously had decided to cancel me. But what I'm saying is I just go, OK, we'll do it another time. That's fine. I'll get on with some other stuff. And so you know, it really interests me that there are these, what happens is we carry over the assumptions from one technological context to another. You know, I find it, I find it really interesting in electric cars because I suddenly realised that... Um, uh, you know, um, electric car charging points, unlike petrol stations, aren't very visible. So actually, if you're driving in your electric car and you say, uh, find me charging stations, if you're driving through London, you're bombarded with them. There are tons of the bloody things. But unlike a BP station, they're not on a main thoroughfare and they don't have a massive great light. So... You know, as a consequence, what's happening is people go, oh, I don't know where I'd charge my car. Well, actually, that's a change because petrol stations existed in an age before GPS and their locations predates GPS. So they had to be on a high traffic road with high visibility and high advanced visibility so you could decelerate enough to turn off and go and buy your six gallons of five star and a pork pie from M&S Simply Foods. Of course, that doesn't apply anymore. There's no point in taking up what you might call prime retail real estate for an electric car charging point, and it isn't very big, and you can't see it. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of that's the kind of point I'm making, which is that an awful lot of our behaviours come from failing to do this business of correcting for new information, where effectively thinking with a with a kind of prediction and expectation which might have been formed in circumstances different to the ones we find ourselves in so many insights rory and i was mentioning there uh don draper we've heard about books that have been important to you in 2023 has that you've had a more of a, an audio year it seems than actually a, a visual year but have there been things that have caught your eye yeah, films I, I, or television or uh, podcasts yes um by the way i'll give you a story about this um if you're invited to go on a podcast generally go on a podcast okay and the maths that i i give as an example for that is two things okay um one of which is um that it's much more efficient spending one hour talking to 100 people than spending 100 hours talking to 100 people one at a time, okay? Simple as that, okay? We've got 98 people here, okay? Well, okay, if you subtract me, for me, that's 97. Now, if I wanted to go and have a coffee with all of you, it would take three weeks of my entire working life. I don't think we're fully conscious of these multiplier effects. And I always make that case, which is the second thing I make the case for and I always have massive arguments with Ogilvy's press people about this, OK, is the Ogilvy press people always go, you've got to have a strategy. You've got to be really efficient with your time. You've got to be really ruthless. You've got to dedicate your um, your conferences. You've, you've only got to go to the conferences which, you know, genuinely have large numbers of people who are in marketing directors and blah, 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 blah. And I go, I'm terribly sorry, but that's bollocks, OK? Um, and the reason is that the, the, the mentality to adopt in promoting yourself is one which is opportunistic, not which is efficiency focused. What you're trying to do is optimize expectation. Op sorry, opt this is Nassim Taleb language. 
optimize your increase your surface area exposure to possible upside optionality. Now, the reason I got invited to do a TED talk was because I gave a talk to Nokia after we just won the Motorola account and the people in the Ogilvy press office were going, oh, my goodness, what if you do this? What if you do that? I said, look, I promised this before we won the Motorola account. So I'm going to do it because I promised to do it. And you, um, I'm just going to I'll write an email to anybody and say, look, uh, you know, I'm not presenting anything I wouldn't present to you. Um, and of course, the client's totally unconcerned. OK. Now, there was someone there who was from Nokia, unsurprisingly, because it was a Nokia conference, who said, we'd like you to speak at Nokia World. And I speak at Nokia World, which is 2,000 people in Rotterdam or somewhere. I can't remember where it was. Or the Hague. OK. And then at Rock Nokia World, um, at the time, Chris Anderson from TED was sitting at the back. And he came up to me and said, I'd like you to do a TED talk. That's actually how it works. OK. Um, that actually, the extent to which you can predict and therefore focus on looking for success in a world which is high on opportunity okay now i'll tell you the other story of that i mean i don't know if anybody else is a fan of chris williamson's podcast it's okay what is um, the name of that podcast uh, uh, it's called modern wisdom modern okay? wisdom and he's actually been so successful with that okay now i've been on twice that the, the late the later one hasn't come out yet he's been so successful with that, that he's moved to austin texas he's actually a a smoggy, um, which I understand is a type of like in the northeast. You have smoggies, monkey hangers, and geordies. I don't fully understand that, but anyway, he's a smoggy, but he's moved to Austin, Texas. Because it's like podcasting central. Okay. Now the funny thing is, when I agreed to go on his podcast, I hadn't it was quite in the early days of his podcast, I hadn't got a clue who he was. Right. <laughs> okay. So what I what I am suggesting is that there is this trade-off between Effectively, there's this trade-off which which I obsess about, which is the exploit explore trade-off, and that's I won't mention the bees again because you've all heard me talk about the bees. But there is this trade-off between exploiting what you already know, okay, which means that if you happen to know Chris Williams, ask to go on his podcast again, or ask him to recommend you to other podcasters in Austin who might like you on the show. You don't get, in other words. There's a trade-off between being long-term lucky and resilient and being short-term efficient. And most modern companies are completely blind to that trade-off. They think that short-term efficiency and exploitation of what they already know is a proxy for long-term success. And it really, really isn't. And I, I think that's, that, that's a, a, what, what has happened now in business is we have the procurement finance nexus, which makes it impossible for businesses to innovate. Because finance are busy trying to impress. Procure. I mean, the, the thing that really worries me in the advertising industry, I've been on a Robin Bond podcast talking about this, is that the advertising industry is trying to optimize what's profitable, OK, in terms of billable hours. But what's profitable in advertising is not what's valuable. OK, the things you do which make money are not the things which actually add value. It's it, it's an oblique business. OK, the real value comes from sort of insights that arise from the process of producing an advertisement and uh, creativity and things like that. Most of the money is made doing sort of time consuming, you know, you know, programmatic kind of stuff. OK, and so you have the finance department doing that. The procurement, it's very difficult to innovate because the procurement department are only interested in how much they're paying. They're not remotely interested in how much value you're creating because value is indeterminate and impossible to predict in advance, whereas costs and cost reduction are certain are certainties. And so once you create this loop of kind of left brain, Ian McGilchrist, left hemisphere thinking, it's very, very difficult to escape from. In other words, once you put two left hemisphere people together and you give them a spreadsheet, okay, you create something which is actually effectively a you know, a feedback loop of reductionism. And it, it never goes away. And, it you know, we've, I, I think, you know, my, my great concern is it's killing the, you know, it's killing the advertising mm. industry. Mm. And to all extents and purposes, I think 2023 has been the year of uh, uh, AI chat GPT and the, uh, the dry fryer. Um, <laughs> so looking forward. Oh, can I give you, can I, can I give you, this is actually a, a, a message of, so you mentioned the air fryer. <laughs> One of the things I mentioned in my book, I'm, I'm going to no, no, mention a present, which if you have a relative or friend who's over, let's say, 65, 
or indeed under 65, okay, this is the most interesting thing in the world in terms of a failure. The standard thing we always talk about is how do we put a man on the moon before we put wheels on luggage, okay? How come that literally the wheeled suitcase appeared on this earth after we'd actually done the moon landings in 69? And, you know, let's face it, it doesn't require a huge leap of imagination. Now, it happens that I think inline wheels uh, developed for skateboarding and things were actually highly decisive in making really good, smooth, smooth flowing uh, luggage. There was also an element of snobbery, which was that, um, you know, wheel luggage or luggage trolleys were either you, you would expect to have a porter in the 1940s. You would have had a person who carried your luggage and you would have tipped them. So there were status considerations and also did wheel luggage make you look a bit elderly? OK. But here's the weirdest thing, OK. 98% of the world's trays are two-handled trays that you carry in front of you like a servant, effectively, okay? And you have a teapot and cups and saucers, okay? Now, there is such a thing you can buy as a tray with a, a handle, by which I mean it's got a big handle that comes out of the middle of the tray or two handles, and you hold it with one hand, okay? Now, that is a far more extreme case of a failure to innovate than the wheel luggage, okay? Because it, because when you have two hands on a tray, you can't open a door. You have to sort of go through doors with your bum first. You have to constantly keep the thing level by correcting between your two hands with no work being done with gravity at all, okay? And, the, and if you go up or downstairs, you can't hold the banisters because you need both hands to hold the fucking tray, right? If you go on sites, there are a few interesting ones which are like ethnic Moroccan trays, which come with a handle. So you hold it with one hand, gravity keeps it then level because a pot of tea is quite heavy, and you walk around opening doors, sweeping this tray through everything uh, like a pro. You know, you're like a French waiter, okay? You just pick up this thing and you go, and here's your tea. You I mean, wouldn't quite do that, but you get my point. And the gravity keeps it level. Now, the weird thing is the only place you can buy these are on disability websites, handle trays. I think Amazon has them, but they're manufactured by a company which specializes for disabled people, you know, who either have, you know, problem with a hand or they have problem, obviously, you know. Sorry, but we should actually burn all existing trays and replace them with these. And the reason is, if you know anybody, as I said, over 60, Buy them one of these fucking things. I bought my parents-in-law one. I bought my father one. They're both absolute evangelists for the tray with a sodding handle, okay? But the reason you should also buy them one is the likelihood that they fall downstairs. My father's best friend died falling backwards downstairs while carrying a, a tray of tea upstairs at the age of about 88. Uh, the likelihood that someone has a fall uh, while carrying a tray strikes me as insanely likely. So if you wanted, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the tray with a handle, if it were made universal, added like three months to average to average life expectancy. And yet, for whatever wacko reason, most trays don't have a handle. OK, that's what I mean by, you know, effectively spotting blind spots and then asking, you know, and, and the extent to which we we optimize for what we expect. And we think, oh, that's a nice tray. And nobody's actually thinking, what? fucking stupid thing that requires two hands for you to carry a pot of tea and three saucers and cups around with you. I sort so, of answered Raju's question there. I was just going to bring Raju in. Raju Nair said, looking ahead, if you had a crystal ball, what are two top consumer trends in 2024? I sort of hate to break it to you, but I feel it's not going to be the one handled tray but well, well, have well, you well, got well, any well, other well, well, insights? It, uh, seriously, it should be, because once you've bought one of these things, you go, shit, why did I ever put up with anything else? <laughs> it, so it is one of those things which I call a bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a one-way door. Once you've experienced it, you never go back. Um, I, and I would like to make that a trend for serious reasons, which I think it's genuinely, you know, uh, uh, a huge after safety. After this, everybody, you need to look out on Google Trends. Mm -hmm. Hmm. See if there's a search for it, it, uh, yeah, it, it, trays, it, one handle trays, and because <laughs> you remember, you remember the behavioral science, uh, Ogilvy behavioral science practice mantra, which is dare to be trivial, which is that don't necessarily, when solving a problem, one of the greatest mistakes is people assume that the scale of the intervention has to be proportionate to the scale of the desired effect, and in a complex world like the one we live in, and actually, to be honest, the one we've always lived in. 
Um, there are butterfly effects everywhere. Start by hunting butterflies before you then try and have a massive intervention. I was quite impressed, by the way. Um, I'll tell you a reason why people from um, uh, one reason of many why people from uh, often immigrant backgrounds uh, are very, very successful entrepreneurs. OK, and it's quite simple, which is a lot of them grow up in a shop. And if you grow up in a shop or a restaurant, it's like a free MBA because you get the whole of a business that is just about comprehensible and you understand the interdependent parts of that business. What happens now is we produce a load of graduates and they go into a specialized field like procurement where they're optimizing for one thing. OK, and there's a really, really important point which we need to understand that there, there are things which are micro rational and macro stupid. OK where if you optimize for a narrow measure, what you're doing makes complete sense within the sphere of your own particular silo, but is actually dumb in terms of the interest of the organization you work for. Particularly a male problem, by the way, since I think men, it's both a virtue and a, and a weakness of men, that men will compete over anything, even if there's absolutely no point to it, okay, right? I would I would give it as a female virtue, which is they're more likely to say, are you sure we should be doing this? Whereas you know, just as men will compete over stupid sports or kind of, you know, place bets on who can get it, you know, that that male competitive, hyper competitive urge is both valuable and a curse, I think, depending on how it's actually harnessed. But this thing about things that are, we're often doing things that are micro rational. And then you look at it systemically and you go, actually, those two things we're trying to do are in opposition to each other. You know, uh, they're not they're actually contradictory. You know, one of the worst things I think you can do is feel that you're efficient when you're busy. Because the extent to which you're working effectively, I mean, you know, one one really interesting thing with flexible work is the extent to which, you know, uh, they said, oh, people are two percent less productive if they work from home. Well. Tell them to work five minutes longer. They'll take that train off. It's not that big a deal, right? Okay, right. It's not that that isn't rocket science. But also the extent to which a lot of people, I think, in we don't really in the office in in knowledge economies, we don't really measure outputs. We measure we measure inputs, and I think that's led. I think in the open plan visible office, it's led to a lot of actually toxic behaviour. Presenteeism being the most obvious one, but effectively. You know, to be honest, in, if you're in a knowledge economy, really, you should be spending one day of you know, seven or eight hours a week just hanging out and chilling and trying to get lucky. But you get these people who are basically sort of, you know, micro focused on meeting some bonus objective. I think it's, I think we've done a terrible thing when we did that. I mean, literally a terrible thing where you bonus people on a very specific metric. Um. And so, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is basically, you know, it, it's uh, sub-level Ian McGilchrist. It's just the fight against reductionist quantification in everything, really. Mm. And, so, and be, yeah. <laughs> I uh, mentioned when you joined us, Rory, more than anyone, you are able to speak without prompting. And we've all really enjoyed hearing your uh, your insights into life today with only a couple of prompts from myself. Well, um, we can, we, we're doing a rapid fire. We can do a bit of rapid fire. Uh, a little like. bit of rapid. OK, all right. OK, that's a challenge. So, so I'll, I'll have a look at the chat because there are lots last, on the chat. So there are a few last, questions last on the chat. Last thing you bought and loved. How's that for a rapid fire? Mm. Last thing you bought and loved. Last thing I bought and loved. Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, actually, OK, I'll give you another Christmas tip, um, uh, along with mattress toppers, air fryers and Japanese toilets. There is an interesting technology which I think is underexploited, which is bone conducting headphones. Now, bone conducting headphones, by the way, if you know anybody over 70, you could buy them some bone conducting headphones because they actually they vibrate through the cheekbones. OK. And they send the vibrations straight to the inner ear. Now, what's often happened in older people is what, one of the reasons they're deaf is that the the mechanical bit that connects the eardrum to the inner ear, the stirrup and the anvil and all those things has become a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated in oldie tech and disabled tech. And by the way, another great book to read, by the way, um, <laughs> Helen Edwards from Marginal to Mainstream. You know, Helen Edwards, if you know her from Marketing Week, 
She's one of the people, along with, you know, Ritson people, who I kind of venerate in the marketing sphere. She's absolutely fantastic. And her book, From Marginal to Mainstream, which also shares the prediction, which I've also made, which is that, you know, in 10 to 20 years, 10 to 15 percent of the population might be nomadic. In other words, don't buy a house, buy an electric motorhome. Because if you've got a big American luxury motorhome and you've got a 200 kilowatt hour battery, man, you can go off the grid and run your Nespresso machine and your telly and your, you'll have your Elon Musk's, you know, Skylink thing, whatever it's called. OK, right. We can actually go off the grid now. The toilet's the last remaining problem, really. And we just need a microwave toilet and we're done. We can just go off the grid. And if you look at an American, a huge luxury American motorhome, OK, costs less than a totally shit flat in London. Now, admittedly, it's not going to go up in value, but then maybe the flat in London isn't going to go up in value for the next 15 years. So it's time to get on the road. OK, but but um, sorry, I digress. Bone conducting headphones could be very good if you're elderly and have impaired hearing. They're mostly marketed to joggers, who are the opposite of the demographic thing, typically, because you don't lose situational awareness and end up using your um, massive over-the-ear noise-cancelling headphones and run under a bus, which can happen, OK? And you can also weirdly use them in a swimming pool, although I don't plan to do that. I, that, that strikes me as weird, OK? But there are very, the other application for this, it strikes me, is podcast listening, which is actually wandering around the house. Now, OK, now I'm going to get cancelled for this, but bear in mind this is reversible, OK? It's not sexist, OK? I occasionally call my soddy over-the-air WM whatever they are, WH005s, uh, my wife cancelling headphones, okay? They're noise cancelling headphones. You can equally call them husband cancelling headphones. It's just that they basically, they're noise cancelling. And for certain things like immersion, like music, that's really, really powerful. You know, there are times when we want to be immersed. I think that this Apple goggle thing, I don't think fundamentally humans like being visually immersed. I think there are loads of times where actually we can just listen to music and immerse ourselves in the music without losing complete vision of what's going on around us. OK, but I think for podcasts and spoken word, uh, we don't actually want that level of immersion. If you look at digital radios, they started as pieces of hi-fi equipment, but nobody wants to listen to Radio 4 on a massive, powerful speaker. You want a little box in the corner of the room because it's like a person talking to you. Now, I wouldn't recommend bone, bone conducting headphones, which are usually made by a company called Shox, but there are other competitors. I wouldn't recommend it for uh, audiophiles or for music listening. But if you're a fan of spoken word stuff, I think it's a bit of a breakthrough. So that, that would be another tech tip along with a tray with a handle. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Rory. Um, well, I don't think we're going to have anything as much as a, a, a rapid fire. But uh, uh, Rory, it's been an absolute honour to have you join us here again with 42 Courses. You're very supportive of 42 Courses in general. Uh, anyone visiting our website will see that Rory is a uh, host and in many of our courses. And of course, if anyone on the call wants training, for their company, please reach out to Chris, chris at 42courses.com. And also we have a new Ad 101 course that has just launched on the website. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, you all as joining us today can use the voucher Don Draper VIP <laughs> to get a discount on the Ad 101 course, if you search around, you might find it will be valid for discounts on other courses. Oh, oh. Yes. So, someone's just some, someone's just put themselves up here as Alex Hormozzi's buddy. Now, um, uh, that's another book I really recommend. Hundred million dollar offers by Alex Hormozzi. He's a big regular on the podcast scene. So if you like, get into what he says. What is interesting, I think, is you're beginning to find these people who are marketers, and I include myself on the fringes of this who actually, and I think this is really welcome, marketing people from a marketing standpoint, starting to pronounce on wider issues other than brand comms. And I think, I think that's a really important trend. And any of you who have an appetite for doing that kind of thing, uh, you know, I make the joke, which is only half a joke, okay? You have a load of economists deciding what the top take rate of tax should be in the UK. It's currently 40% or 45% above a certain threshold, okay? Now, I don't want to be rude, but anybody in retail would tell you the top rate of tax should be $39.99, shouldn't it? Right? Not 40%. Okay. Any retailer would have told you that. 
<laughs> right. Because what you want is the lowest perceived rate that minimizes the downside effect it has on incentives to work while raising the most revenue. OK, it's a retail problem. It's not an economic problem. OK, right. So and the Alex Hormozy book, by the way, he's a really, really interesting guy. I've connected with him a couple of times. There's also a book called by a guy who founded a restaurant in New York, which is Service. I think it's called Service Beyond Reason by Will something or other. Uh, and it's about, it's about customer experience. And it's absolutely I'm actually quoted in it. I'm flattered to say it's but uh, uh, but not for that reason. It's a really astonishing book. Thank you so much. Any, Rory. Anybody, anybody in the experience economy, go there straight away. He's great. Will thingy me, Bob. Yeah, I'll remember. <laughs> Will it. thingy me, Bob. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Rory, for joining us, sharing so many of your insights. Thank you all so much for joining us on this call. It's so great to see you. Familiar faces, familiar names, and to see new names as well. And have a marvelous Christmas. We'll share the recording of this on Monday with everybody. And we hope that you all have a very Merry Christmas. Happy New you, Year. You have thank a great you Christmas. again, Rory. And Shout out to Amelia, Amelia Turod, who I've just noticed. I've noticed quite a few familiar names here. So, But all of you have a really, really great Christmas. And um, uh, don't work too hard. You know, <laughs> thank you. you do. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Rory.